And this is our third study of the minor prophets. Remember, they're minor because their works were shorter than the ones we call the major prophets. And that there are 12 minor prophets. Tonight, we're going to study uh, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And these three prophets are the last ones before the children of Israel went into Babylonian captivity. And when we begin to study Nahum, we should study it along with Jonah. The reason for that is, is that the message of both books are to Nineveh of Assyria. Zephaniah and Habakkuk lived just before Judah's fall to Babylon. And the latter one of these actually witnessed that fall. You recognize that all three of these books are rather brief, but they all have certain unique features about them. If you look to Nahum, you will notice his passionate love for truth and his strong, vehement hatred of its opposite. And we may say that that attitude that he had toward the truth and error is unsurpassed as far as the Bible is concerned. We need to recognize that the Bible talks about hating every false way because one knows the truth. We don't hear much about that today among religious people in particular and even in the church because we have been influenced more that by this political correct stuff, not only in politics and social matters, but also when it comes to the way God deals with people concerning their sins and how serious sin is. When you look at Habakkuk, kind of interesting, because he remonstrates with God over his inability to make sense of what was happening in his time that had to do with God punishing Judah. Zephaniah, again, does as certain of the prophets have done, as we've studied, takes up the theme of the day of the Lord. Now, first of all, let's look at Nahum and then place the other two books in chronological order. And doing that, we'll look at the background. It's been our custom the last two times together of the books of Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. In looking at Nahum, we see, see that he actually discusses Nineveh's day of being in God's favor or grace, and that that was in the past. It had been about 150 years prior to Nahum's work that Jonah had preached to Assyria, and particularly Nineveh, and Nineveh and Assyria at that time was experiencing some very difficult days in the whole of the country. And those people actually listened to the preaching of Jonah and repented. Thus, they were saved at that time. But now a century and one half has passed with those folks. And in Nahum's day, we see that the Assyrians had gotten over a lot that may have conditioned them to receive the preaching of Jonah, of Jonah. And they were at the height of their glory. And because of their wealth and their pride, then Nineveh had lost any semblance of being able to repent of their sins. Now we can date the prophecy from two particular events referred to in the book by the prophet. Down in Egypt, there was a city known as Thebes, and that's the way you run across it in secular history. 
It's known also as no Ammon, no dash Ammon, a great Egyptian city for its time. And it was great throughout the ancient world. What we learn about it in Naaman chapter three and verse eight is that it had already fallen. And none of us fall was yet in the future. Nahum in chapter 2, or Nahum chapter 2, and verse 13, in chapter 3, 5 through 7, and verse 15. Now, the former event occurred in 661 B.C., and the latter in 612 B.C., now, 612 B.C. is only six years before Nebuchadnezzar made his first invasion of the southern kingdom of Judah. So Nahum's ministry is dated somewhere between 650 and 612 B.C. We know nothing about the prophet himself. Well, we can say that. We do know his name, and we know his hometown from Nahum, I keep saying Nahum, Nahum chapter 1 and verse 1. Whether the prophecy was actually published in Nineveh or not, it was certainly published by the prophet in Judah. So they knew what was going to take place. Then we come to the book of Zephaniah. And he prophesied in Judah, in Judah during the reign of King Josiah, 640. 609 B.C. Now you remember, if you're remembering the kings of Judah, that he was one of the good kings of Judah. In the early days of Josiah, idolatry and all the evils that were associated with it were running rampant in the land. And Josiah became king when he was but eight years old, so he had a regent to take care of things until he came of age. He became king because his father, who was wicked, whose name was Ammon, was murdered. Now at 16, Josiah began to seek the Lord, and at the age of 20, he began to purge the land of idols while having the temple repaired, we learn the forsaken or forgotten or lost book of the law was found. Found in the temple, in fact. That's a strange place to find the book of the laws in the temple, isn't it? But it shows how close to things that were religious concerning the southern kingdom of Judah can B, and yet them not studying it, listening to it, understanding it, and certainly not applying it. Josiah's response to the teachings of the law was a very extensive series of religious and social reforms, and that started about 621 B.C., the account of which is found in 2 Kings chapter 22 through chapter 23, 2 Kings Chapters 22 through 23. And the best we can tell is that Zephaniah evidently prophesied just prior to these great reforms done by King Josiah. And he could very well, in view of the fact that he was prophesying, speaking where the Lord warned him to speak, they had found the law, they had studied it, and Josiah was of a mind to believe and obey it. He could have very well had a help in producing these reforms as they sought to go back to the teaching of the law. If the Hezekiah of Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 1 is the good king of Judah, then Zephaniah was of royal blood. And he would have been a cousin to King Josiah. Turning now to the next book, Habakkuk, we find that it's a very unique among really all the books, all the minor prophet books. 
Other prophets pled with the people of, on behalf of God to get them to repent and return to God. But we find in reading Habakkuk that he pleads with God on behalf of the children of Israel, of Judah. Habakkuk 1, verse 2, and chapter 2, verse 1. We have no information at all about the life or the career of this prophet, Habakkuk. And the date of his prophecy is fixed in relation to a statement that's made in Habakkuk 1 and verse 6. Assyria had fallen to the Chaldees. Now, the Chaldees were the Babylonians. And the Babylonians were the world power. And you'll recall Daniel's prophecy to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the great figure that he dreamed and the different parts of the figure representing kingdoms, including Babylon and the kingdoms to follow, because that's a prophecy of the coming kingdom of God that would take place in the days of the Roman Empire. We know also that the uh, nation of Babylon had not invaded Judah at this point, according to Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 6. So let's do a little reasoning. Since Assyria fell to Babylon in 612 B.C., just six years before Nebuchadnezzar made his first invasion of Judah. And Babylon invaded then that time. The book must be dated within this six-year period. Habakkuk would have been a contemporary of the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. It also tells us then that there were different prophets working that were faithful to God. Why God in his infinite wisdom selects only certain ones, we don't know. We know there were oral prophets who never wrote anything but still spoke God's will to the people. But when we read in the Old Testament what these prophets and the major prophets said, then, of course, they had to be writing what they wrote. But others did the work of God as prophets without writing. Now, for a moment, let's turn then as we been doing and studying each one of these books of the Minor Prophets by threes. And look at the messages of Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. The message of Nahum actually centers around God's vengeance upon the impenitent. Now pause here and think about what we said about the previous six Minor Prophets. And then think about how they were written before time for our learning and how these truths are made even more clear when you see the gospel, God's power to save us today, preached in the world. And thus we see that we find, well, we see Paul preaching of righteousness, temperance, that's self-control, and judgment to come. And fundamentally, when you preach the whole counsel of God, it's in those three areas that you're going to be teaching. Consider what is said in Nahum uh, chapter 1 in the first part of verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger. Now notice he didn't say he never would get angry. It just says that the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And then he said, and will not at all acquit the wicked. Now keep that in mind. Because every way you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, you're seeing that God says this time on earth is given to man so that they can show they love God and will keep his commandments and act out of faith based upon what says the Lord. Now, there's another interesting statement made in verse 7 of chapter 1, and it's good to know for the faithful serving God under any and all problems and good times, bad times and tribulations. Verse 7 reads, the Lord is good, a strong hold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. 
and he knoweth them that trust in him. Now, if that's not written to comfort those who are faithful to God as they even undergo persecution for their faith, then what would it be written for? What's the purpose of it? What do you learn from it as a faithful child of God? As Paul would say, if God be for us, who can be against us? We need to understand that as we go through life and the problems of life that are normal to every person here, regardless of whether they're Christians or not, but then especially to Christians, when we know the Bible says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So heaven's slowness to anger is demonstrated here in the sparing of Nineveh, for a century and a half since Jonah had preached to them. Now, Nineveh, the chief city, the capital city of Assyria, would have to reap the consequences of her long-term impenitence. When you read the book of Nahum, you have to be careful not to mistake the prophet's righteous indignation for personal hatred on his part. I don't know of a place in the Bible, Old or New Testament, that approves of one's personal hatred of another person at all. Righteous indignation is being very upset and angry because people will not obey God. When you read Peter saying in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It ought to upset faithful children of God to see people spurning the time God's given them simply pursue the affairs of this present world, not even thinking about the judgment and eternity. Zephaniah speaks to an idolatrous Judah and all of the sins that went along with idolatry. He denounces the sins of his fellow countrymen, and he does so not sparing them with words. He is to the point. He is candid in what he says to them about their sins and what's going to happen to them. He's very frank in his words. As I said, uh, this was not to be a prophet of God and be faithful in life and work is not to be somebody that mints his words. He said what he meant. He meant what he said because God was putting the words in his mouth for the good of the people, no matter how strongly he rebuked them for their sins. So his strong convictions and this uh, fervent zeal that was his are evident in every line of the book as you read it. That should characterize members of the Lord's church concerning their attitude toward themselves, toward their brethren in the Lord, but especially toward the world and the sins it's in. When Paul waited for his companions in Athens, when he looked around and saw all of the sin involved in, in, in idolatry, he says his spirit was moved within him. He was upset. He wanted them to know the truth. He wanted them to know their error. He wanted to show them the way of righteousness. And that should characterize everyone who's a faithful child of God. And if you're faithful, it will. Now, the theme of the book is this, that the day of the Lord is at hand for Judah. Chapter 1, verses 7 through 18. Now, the immediate event in view was, of course, as I've said several times, Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of the land that came first in 606 B.C. Now, looking to Habakkuk, we see he prophesied just before, or we may say on the eve of Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of the land, and the prophet is very puzzled. He's confused to some extent over just why God would allow such a thing. In other words, why would God use a people 
far more wicked than Judah to punish his own chosen people. And this is another form of what is known as the notorious problem of evil. Why should heathens prosper at the expense of God's people? Man, Habakkuk is sometimes called, if you read much about him, the Job of the minor prophets. What they didn't quite grasp was that it didn't make any difference if you're God's chosen people. We can make that over today and say it makes no difference if the church is the Lord's church. If fleshly Israel was punished because of their repeated sins over generations, then what makes us think that the church, when it neglects what God put it here on earth to do in being the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the leavening for good in the world, to teach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the gospel, to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, to live righteous lives. When members of spiritual Israel commit sin and refuse to repent, then is there not a message from these prophets and other prophets that were sent to fleshly Israel? Tell them of the punishment coming upon them for their sins. The theme then of the book is that the person who remains faithful to God through thick and thin, we may say, faithful to God and his truth, all of his truth, will be able to survive the ordeal about to come. Now, that is said within the context that I mentioned some time ago, everything in the Bible that blesses the faithful child of God always says it within the context that it's an appointed unto men wants to die. If you could be so faithful that you never would die, then, of course, that'd be another story indeed. But the Bible never says that. The blessings pronounced by God upon his children, whether fleshly Israel or spiritual Israel, the church, always does so with the idea that all men must die unless the Lord comes back first. And either way, we will leave the fleshly walks of this life. We will not have any lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes of pride of life. The way things work here and are necessary to work here is a place of where we show God we love him and have faith in him. That won't exist anymore. But God will get you through, or else Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 makes no sense at all. We sing a song, God will take care of you. Well, will he? According to the scriptures, he will. We can get through things. God will preserve us. It may even come a time to where our death is the best thing for us. We trust God on the basis of his word. We take him at his word that he knows how to take care of us. You might want to jot down Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, with that in mind. Now let's turn, as we have done on the other studies of those books, look at the major themes or what we may call the issues in these particular books. First of all, let's know what they have to say, see what they have to say about perpetuating righteousness humility and penitence watch it please do not i say they do not necessarily reproduce themselves in successive generations of a nation a family or the church people have to love god they have the will to love god with all they have in all they are. They have to will to love their neighbors themselves. They have to will to put into practice the principles of righteousness in order to be made after the Lord's will and the likeness of Christ. And so the church itself is a teaching institution. The truth of God is conveyed by teaching. Thus, we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and all that it means to preach the gospel to every creature. We preach the whole counsel of God, as Paul said he did, to the church at Ephesus. 
And we're taught in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, as Paul said to Timothy, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So God's people are perpetuated because they will listen to the truth. They will learn the truth. They will obey the truth. They will teach the truth. And they will contend for that truth. Nineveh repented with sincerity at Jonah's preaching, but they had in succeeding generations become utterly depraved at the time then that Nahum does his work with them and their time had run out as far as God giving them any more opportunity to change. The same sort of apostasy had been witnessed before within Israel. And all you have to do to see that is turn to the judges, every man doing that which was right in his own eyes. They served God, they fell away. A judge was raised up and freed them. They served God, they fell away. A judge was raised up and he freed them. And that goes on and on and on. I don't know why that's not a good description of spiritual Israel. Among the people of God in the Lord's church, the family of God, the kingdom of Christ, you've got some who serve him faithfully, and yet their children may not. Uh, their parents may not have served God faithfully, but their children do. So we realize then that for people to be what God expects them to be, and they must be if heaven's to be their home, and they've got to want to do right. You might write down there, as I said, when I referred you to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 2, verses 6 through 13. Judges 2, 6 through 13. It's the responsibility of parents to teach the word of the living God to their own children so that they can learn that the truth of God the gospel in particular is an intelligent, rational faith. They need to understand it. They need to have their own personal conviction based upon their proper knowledge of the word. They need to be taught the truth. It needs to be exemplified before them by their parents and by other Christians. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 6 and 7, Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7, make it very clear that you're to keep the word of God before the family all of the time, every day, no matter what the situation is. So everyone, but especially our children, need to know not only what they should believe, but are entitled to know why they should believe it. Just remember that departure from God, apostasy, is always just one generation away. Then we see another theme that runs throughout these prophets, and that is what it means to live by faith. And you see how there's this overlapping as we remember the last six books we studied, and now these three. Habakkuk taught that the just person would live by his faith. That is, he, he was faithful. Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. Faithfulness comes from the Hebrew word imuna. Now, the basic meaning of imuna is having to do with moral steadfastness. In effect, Habakkuk was told that God would always be true to himself in delivering the person who maintains his own integrity and keeps God's commandments. Thus again, we're reminded of the writer of Ecclesiastes saying, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And the New Testament, 
faith, and you might put a slash there, faithfulness is a very broad principle, an important principle, a major principle, which entails trusting God according to his word in all things and always following the path of divine truth that come what may. Christians, as that term is used and defined in the scriptures, are people who, as Paul wrote, walk by faith, not by sight. In other words, they walk as the word of God leads, guides, and directs them in all things rather than in their own self-will ways. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, I say again, yet most men walk according to their own self-will ways, gratify the appetites of the flesh without caring too much about anybody else. Well, we see that they dealt with perpetuating righteousness. They dealt with living by faith. And they also dealt with the day of the Lord. You have noticed, I said earlier in this lesson, how the minor prophets dealt with this idea of the day of the Lord. They called attention to the fact that they would be brought into judgment. And that if they were unfaithful, which God did not bring them into judgment until they were, that destruction was the only thing that was before them when this kind of thing happened. In fact, Zephaniah teaches that it would be not only a day of wrath for sinners, but also one of salvation for the righteous. Zephaniah 2, verses 1 through 3. And of course, this sounds like preaching any part of the New Testament. Now let's do a little more summarizing of these books. And we'll look first of all at the book of Nahum. The Lord is first of all unsparing in his disposition of mind, his attitude toward evil. If we could get that one point across even to our members, how much better off we would be. Chapter one of Nahum verses one through eight. Now, in particular, Nathan prophesied that Nineveh would experience the wrath of God by a complete overthrow, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. And then God gave him a prophetic vision of the actual siege of Nineveh in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. He even talks about Nineveh being plundered in chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. And of course, it had become a very proud city for reasons we've already given, and thus they would be brought low. All of this was to come upon them as punishment for their sins, for which they wouldn't repent, but they had been given time to repent. In fact, that they repented at the preaching of Jonah should have put them on the right track, and yet they left off from what they did when Jonah preached to them. You take, take note of chapter 3, 1 through 7 along that line. And thus punishment could not be averted. Chapter 3, 8 through 19. People like to try to say, well, when is God going to bring the world into judgment? Well, nobody knows. Jesus was clear about that. He'll come as a thief in the night. But we can be sure it will be when God's long-suffering has run out with the whole human race. There are final assertions of the prophecy in the remainder of the book, but we now turn ourselves to the book of Habakkuk. And Habakkuk really asks God why sin is being tolerated in Judah. That's in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And God replies by saying that he's raising up Babylon to punish his people for their long-term sins and their refusal to repent, chapter 1, 5 through 11. Well, when that's answered, this leads to the second question of how God could use people, as I said earlier, who are so ungodly, so worse off than uh, Judah, to punish Judah, chapter 1 verse 12 through chapter 2, verse 1. Well, notice what God does. He says, 
Babylon's going to be punished in its own turn too. Chapter 2, verses 2 through 20. And this may very well let us know that God may use wicked people to punish other wicked people in his providential care of this earth. And yet God being a perfectly just God, he'll judge every one of them. The book ends with Habakkuk's prayer of confident faith in the Lord. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. Now to the book of Zephaniah. Here you find the prophet announcing the judgment of the earth in what we said all along was a part of all their preaching during or in the day of the Lord. It would come upon all nations at that time, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, that he was concerned with. Judah and Jerusalem in particular, chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. No sinner would escape. Sinners of all rank, poor, rich, whatever, they would be judged, chapter 1, verses 7 through 13. And that that judgment day for them was very near. It was at hand, chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. Thus, God's prophet pleaded for men to seek deliverance from the Lord, chapter 2. Verses 1 through 3. Now, the second major section of the book emphasizes that no, no nation would escape the day of the Lord, chapter 2, 4 through 15. And he goes on and points out that if the heathen were to be punished, Judah should expect her share of the same, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. I suggest you go back, if you haven't in a while, and read Deuteronomy, known as the restatement of the law, done by Moses, just before he dies and just before Joshua leads the children of Israel over to take the land of Canaan. Over and over in that book, he says, God's going to do to you what he does to these nations if you forget him, if you sin, if you act like they do. And now this is all coming to pass. The third and final section of the book looks to the future. You know, in preaching the truth of God today in the gospel, you point out what's going to happen to sinners if they don't repent, obey the gospel, and remain faithful to God. But you also point out that when they do, and to the faithful in the church already, that God is going to save them eternally in heaven in a glorified state that the mind of man at this time can't even begin to appreciate. So a remnant for Israel at that time, because the Messiah still must come according to Judah and the family of David, would be gathered from among the heathen, chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, and sanctified to the Lord, chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. And Israel would be exalted before the world, chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. So here is a, for lack of a better way to put it, a prophetic glimpse of the restoration of the Jews to their homeland, which took place under Zerubbabel and Ezra. So what may we conclude from the study of these books? Well, actually, all of this has carried us through the minor prophets who preceded the exile of the Jews, Judah, Jerusalem, and Babylon. Now, if you read these books, you'll see that their words, their expressions, their descriptions, their statements to the sinners was harsh. It was full of strong rebuke. And yes, it was foreboding when they talk about the day of the Lord and it was at hand. The impenitence of their hearers made it inevitable that the punishment from God would come. In other words, he wouldn't be a just God if he didn't. Now, when we look to the last three, Lord willing, in our next time together, Haggai, 
Zechariah, and the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. Then we'll complete our survey of the Old Testament and studying the message of God to those people who survived and returned from Babylonian exile, the remnant that is spoken of here. Now, when we do that, we conclude next week. I'll announce what we'll do after that, since we still don't know what's going to take place over this whole COVID-19 business. I do want to urge you as children of God to be praying for the end of this. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And that you will keep in mind the brethren throughout the world and others who are suffering worse than what I know we are. But we want to remember one another in prayer as the church at spring. We want to remember our duties as members of the church at spring. We want to remember to study the Bible daily to be engaged in prayer and to take note of all those things that we take for granted. And yet with a little invisible bug, all these things can be carried away almost in a moment. Think of how great America thinks it is economically and in all sorts of other ways. How many other nations of the world think the same thing? And yet in a matter of weeks, we see these things take place. Well, whether God meant it to be a message to us or not, it ought to be because it shows us as mere human beings, we're not so much after all, are we? And that we ought to say if the Lord will, thus and so, not think so highly of ourselves, lest we be brought low. But we'll conclude our study tonight. Sorry we had the problems last night. We think we've got them worked out now. We're glad you could be with us, and I urge you to continue to study the scriptures and pray to God. Thank you very much. Have a good night.